Um, Tonight's reading is from Matthew chapter 28, starting at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together then as we open God's word. Our loving Father, We rejoice as your people this evening to be able to entrust our time now to the work of your Holy Spirit. That as we, your people, open and think about your word, we're confident in you that you will meet with each one of us and speak your word clearly to our hearts and move us by your spirit, to walk in obedience to your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've been around the church for any length of time whatsoever, tonight's reading will not have surprised you one little bit, because it's entitled in all of our Bibles, I think, The Great Commission. And so whenever you get missionary speakers or we talk about mission, at some point someone's going to go to this text, the Great Commission. And I'm sure, therefore, you've read it quite a lot of times. You've probably heard it preached a number of times. But I wonder if you've ever looked at the five Great Commission statements that Jesus actually said. Did you know there were five? They're on the screen behind me. We always seem to zoom in on this most famous one in Matthew 28. But actually, Jesus said a lot more than that about mission. In those 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension, Acts 1.3 tells us that he appeared to his disciples and talked to them about the kingdom of God. And tonight I want to look briefly at each of these five great commission statements that he gave over that 40-day period. And I want to consider them in chronological order of delivery by Jesus because it's different from the way our Bible is ordered. The chronological order is actually different than the biblical order that we see, which is written in order of the Gospels. And the reason I want to do that is because I think it's going to really help us to see how Jesus' teaching on the Great Commission is kind of incremental. What I mean is he builds on his teaching over the 40-day period. The risen Lord Jesus gently and gradually develops this teaching on the Great Commission over these 40 days. Sometimes people think these five statements are what might be called a synoptic problem. Wow, that's a bit fancy. What does that mean? It means different writers' remembrance or expression of the same event. So Jesus said something once, and like Matthew remembered it that way, and Mark remembered it that way, and maybe Luke remembered it another way. And so we're kind of talking about the same thing, but just a different way of expressing it. And I want you to see tonight that's not the case at all. That these are actually five statements made at different times, in four or five different places, incrementally building Jesus' teaching. So that's what we're going to do this evening. And as we do that, I want us to realize that Jesus set out gently, gradually, and developed his plan 
for his mission that he was sending his church to accomplish in the world. Matthew 28 was not the first thing that the risen Jesus said about his plan. I wonder if you know which is the first one. I'm not going to make you. If I was doing a student group, we now sit around and we try and put them in order ourselves, but I was told, please don't do that for us tonight. Give me the answers instead. So we're going to listen to the very first one, which was given on the very night of his resurrection, recorded by John in his gospel, chapter 20, and we're going to hear the whole passage read for us. Greetings from Spain. I'm reading from John chapter 20 and verses 19 to 22. John 20, 19 to 22. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. Where does this event take place, do we think? It's in Jerusalem. It's on the evening of the first day of the week. That's Resurrection Sunday night. That's the night Jesus was raised. Who does he appear to? The disciples. But how many of them? How many of the 12 men that Jesus gathered were present at this event? Mm. There are 10. Because Judas has taken his own life. And we know, if we're careful Bible scholars, that Thomas isn't actually there. Because it tells us later on in the chapter that Thomas was missing in this one. So Jesus, maybe there were other women present, but Jesus is teaching the ten. Ten, frankly, traumatized, terrified followers of this man who's just been brutally executed. And they're locked in an upper room in fear. And isn't it beautiful that the first words of the resurrected Jesus to these traumatized disciples is peace be with you. Peace be with you. What a wonderful, loving Savior we have. Peace. That's their greatest need. Peace. He speaks peace in their trauma. He speaks peace in our trauma. He speaks peace a word of peace, even before he gets on to just a very simple statement of the mission that was coming. It's a bit like an advance warning. He says to them, look, as the Father sent me, so am I sending you. That's what he tells them. As the Father sent me, so am I sending you. They're going to be sent. That's all he tells them. On that first meeting, peace be with you, you're going to be sent. But look carefully at the way that sentence is constructed. It's a form of words in the Greek which says something like, as in the same way that the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. There's a pattern going on, a a, a pattern of being sent that Jesus is following. In the same way that the Father sent me, so am I going to send you. How did did the Father send Jesus? The motivation was one of love. The Father's love motivated him to send his obedient son. And the obedient son in love is willing to be sent by his father. And that son is our savior. And he says, as the father sent me, even so I am sending you, my followers. It's the model for mission. It's Jesus' model for mission. Give that a thank you. The sending of the believers in the same way Jesus was sent. Jesus was sent in the flesh. He was incarnate, enfleshed. He was bodily present 
with the people he was being sent to. In the same way the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Internet evangelism and digital media is fantastic and plays a real role in the world. But we're sent in the flesh as bodies, embodied messengers. The people are to go. You can't just sit over here and bombard people all over the world with messages. That can help. I'm not against any of that digital radio ministry. It's fantastic. But Jesus was sent and he sends us in the same way to be embodied to be embodied witnesses. And every one of us who's following Jesus is a sent one. (laughs) Is a sent one. We are all sent people. His mission is our model. Well, what's the next statement? If you look later, later on in John, you'll see that in John 20, 26, Jesus meets them again. And this time, Thomas is with them. And most likely, this event in John 20, 26, is the event recorded in Mark's gospel, which we're going to hear read now. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptised, will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Rosie melts your heart, doesn't she? (laughs) This event is taking place eight days later. Eight days after that first one. This time, Thomas is present, and wonderfully again, Jesus says, peace be with you. We read that in John 20, 26. Peace be with you. But then he goes on, and he doesn't give a very detailed statement, but it certainly contains a bit more than the first one, where they're merely told you're going to be sent. This time, Jesus says, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all creation. For the first time, he gives them some idea of the magnitude of the mission that he was sending them into. You give that a click. The magnitude of the mission. Go into where? All the world? And proclaim the gospel to who? All creation. (laughs) That must have been surprising (laughs) for these Jewish believers. Eight days after their saviour's been raised. The extent of Jesus' vision for the kingdom that he was talking to them about is beyond global. (laughs) Yeah, going to all the world and proclaim the gospel to all creation. Wow, where are we going to go? The world. A bit more detail, Jesus? It's coming. It's coming. It's an impressive scope for mission. The magnitude of God's mission is in focus here. Now, the Matthew account that we had beautifully read by Becca is the next one. Where did that take place? Did you notice? Flick back to that Matthew chapter uh, 28 that we looked at. Where did it take place? In Jerusalem? Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Galilee. It's at least a three-day journey to walk from Jerusalem to Galilee. Where were the disciples largely from? Galilee. Okay, this is a bit more speculative. I'm pretty sure when they got there, they probably went and said hi to their families for a bit and recap with their friends before they met Jesus on the mountain he told them to go to. So it's at least three days to a week after that previous event. And what happens at that event? In this event, the statement's so much more detailed, isn't it? The famous one that we all know. Two weeks have gone past. I think maybe the disciples are feeling a bit more rested. Maybe they're recovering a bit. Maybe they're getting excited now. They've met Jesus a few times. But Jesus reveals so much more now about the method of this great commission. And I want to show you, we call it the great commission. There are four greats about this commission. And Jesus emphasizes each one. First of all, notice In the first verse there, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This commission is one of great authority. Sometimes I meet Christians who still to this day think, What right have I got to go and tell other people about this faith? There is your right. All authority has been given to Jesus. And when he sends you, you don't go on your own authority. 
or the authority of your own opinion. You go with the full authority of the risen Lord Jesus who said all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go and... The authority is huge. It's a great authority. It's a mandate with its origin in the creator God. The second thing he emphasizes is this great methodology. This statement, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. There's only one command in that sentence in Greek, and it's not go. The command is make disciples. The command is make disciples. The other three are what English students call participles. I hope. My wife will correct me later. Participles. They're the things that you're doing as you make disciples. So as you are going, make disciples, baptizing and teaching. They should, the three should all be ing words. Why is that important? Well, the focus of the great mission that Jesus is sending us on is the making of disciples. Not merely the making of converts, but the growing of disciples of Jesus. And he says, as you go, going out, penetrating new places, wherever you go, what are you to be doing? Be making disciples, baptizing them. So initiating them, bringing them into the faith. And then teaching them everything that I've taught you. That's disciple making. He shows us a very clear methodology for people to be transformed through spiritual formation grounded in the teaching of Jesus. The great scope has been referred to again. Where are we going, Jesus? All nations. And he gives at the end of this a beautiful assurance, a wonderful promise That as you go, making disciples, baptizing and teaching, I'm with you always to the end of the age. When Jesus uses the word nations here, I was explaining yesterday in our day, he's not talking about nation states as you and I think of them. He's not thinking of the 195 countries that we think of. The word he's using here is the word ethne, from which we get ethnic. He's talking about ethnic groups. Go into every ethnic group. And there's a lot more than 195 of those, let me tell you. We've seen some excellent examples of the different ethnicities present here in Hull today. Do you know how many there are in the world? If you were here yesterday, I'm looking for a number to be shouted out. (laughs) No, 17,500 different ethnes. 17,500 different ethnes. And as I said yesterday, more than 7,000 of those groups have never heard of Jesus and have no Christians in their group and will die having never heard unless we obey. The church globally obeys the call of Christ. Go to all ethnes, but I'll be with you always, Jesus says, to the end of the age. That's the third statement. The last two statements take place quite close to each other. They're not in Galilee. They're back in Jerusalem or near Jerusalem. Right before the ascension. Right before Jesus ascends. We're going to listen to the fourth one now in Luke 24. Hi there everyone. Chris here in sunny Spain. Uh, The Bible reading today is taken from Luke 24. Verses 44 to 49. Luke 24, starting at verse 44. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. 
Well, back in Jerusalem, earlier in the chapter, in verse 33, it shows us that the disciples have returned to Jerusalem. They rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, it says. They're back in Jerusalem, not in Galilee. This is not the Matthew 28 event. This is another event taking place in Jerusalem. And it's the most detailed statement regarding the content of Jesus' teaching, his message. And it includes this incredible event that's kind of breathtaking. So breathtaking, I think Rob referred to it when he read from this passage earlier on. This breathtaking statement in verse 45 where he opens their minds to understand the scriptures. Oh, Would you not just love to have been there? He opened their mind to understand the scriptures, the foundation for the content of the message. Jesus gives them here a really succinct message of good news, a message which tells people who Jesus is, the Christ, what he did suffered, and on the third day was raised from the dead. How people should respond? Repentance. What's the benefit of repentance? Forgiveness of sins. The message is very clear. Grounded in the scriptures, that Jesus, who he is, what he did, how you respond, and what the blessing is. Jesus' message is clear. And again reiterates the scope saying it's going to begin from Jerusalem, sure. But where are we going? All ethne, to all ethne. And then the final statement, probably later that same day, they go out to the Mount of Olives, just outside Jerusalem, about an, about an hour's journey away. And we read it, let's hear it now in Acts 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Did you notice in Luke 24, Jesus tells them to wait in the city? Wait in the city. And he refers back to that right there in that reading in Acts chapter 1, earlier than the reading, sorry, that our brother gave. Whilst he stayed with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. They're waiting in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. They go out to the Mount of Olives and Jesus meets with them and tells them this, the means by which they're going to do this. How on earth? How on earth can we do this? This scope's ridiculously large. I'm not saying the disciples are saying this. I'm saying this. This scope's ridiculously large. We're ridiculously few. How on earth do you think we are going to go and accomplish this task? And he gives them the means. Yesterday when we were talking, some of the guys were saying, where do I start? How on earth could I ever be part of this? And I think this speaks to you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. There's the means. There's the means. When I said, wouldn't you have loved to be there when Jesus opened their minds to receive the scriptures and everyone's going, yeah, yeah. What does the Holy Spirit do? What does John 14 tell us that the Holy Spirit's responsibility is? The Holy Spirit will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said. That's what Jesus said. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he opens your minds to receive the scriptures and he reminds you of the scriptures and he teaches you everything, reminds you of everything Jesus said. Our reliance to do this task that God has given to his church is on him. Not on my ability, not on my training and my studies and all those things. Your reliance is on the Holy Spirit of God who is promised to every believer. There's not a person in the room who follows Christ, who has not been given the Holy Spirit. Do you listen to him? Are you filled with him daily? Because he is the means that Jesus told them, wait for this, wait, and I will pour out upon you. I will ask the Father and he'll send the Spirit, the Spirit of truth, to be with you forever. 
And that's what happens, doesn't it, at Pentecost on the next page. The means is the power of the Holy Spirit. But he doesn't stop there. He then reveals a strategic plan, if you like, of how the ethne are going to be reached. He says, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It sets the structure for the book of Acts. If you read through Acts, you'll see. Acts 1 to 7 are very Jerusalem-focused. Acts 8 to 12, look at the mixed races of Samaria and Judea. And from Acts 13 onwards, we're very much focused on the Gentiles, the ethne, the nations. But as I've said already this weekend at some point, and I can't remember when, so forgive me if I've said it a lot, these are not three or four successive missions. It's not like, right guys, stay in Jerusalem, and when Jerusalem's sorted... Then we'll go to Judea and Samaria. And we'll camp there for a few generations until the church is planted and strong. And then and only then will we go to the... No, 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 no. It's not successive missions. They're concurrent missions. They happen at the same time. Well, what does that mean? What does all this mean? Interesting, Jared. Interesting. Well, what does it mean for me? What relevance is this for me tonight, 21st century Hull? Well, hopefully you can see how Jesus gradually unpacks this wonderful mission, his mission, how he explains the model. Put the next slide up, please. He explains the model. As the Father sent, so I send you. He explains the magnitude to all the world, to all creation. He explains the method, disciple-making under his authority. He gives you the message. Jesus' death and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins. And he tells you of the means, the power of the Holy Spirit. We leave this place tonight to go on mission. You get up in the morning and go to wherever you're going on mission. In your homes, in your workplaces, in your schools, wherever you are, you're being sent out on mission. Three closing thoughts, applications for us today. The first one is this. We want you to learn that mission is always going out. The posh word is mission is centrifugal. So scientists know what that means. That's like the machine that spins fast and everything goes to the outside. Is that right? Yeah, I'm not a scientist. Mission is centrifugal. Mission is always going out. And we make a mistake if, like a church I once belonged to a long time ago, we sit in our church building and pray that people will come to us. And that's all we do. We wait for people to come. (laughs) We're called to go out. In fact, we're thrust out. We were learning this morning here at Newland that we're scattered. The motivation, the the, the call of God is to scatter, to go out there. It's not a surprise that if we were to go around the room, every one of us has got a different sphere of service, a different place where we're called to work. You might not think I'm called to work there. I'm telling you tonight, wherever you are, that's where God wants you to be now, right now. It might not be where he wants to keep you. I'm coming to that. (laughs) But it does mean that's your sphere of service now. You're being sent, always going out. Jesus flipped the Jewish expectation that the nations would come to the earthly Jerusalem and said, no, 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 we're, we're going out to the ends of the earth as ambassadors of the word, as we prayed earlier, out to the neighbors Neighbors, we learned this morning, Samar- Samarians who are, who are enemies. We don't like them. No, we start there. We start with our neighbors. And we keep going concurrently from the neighbors to the wider neighbors to the ends of the earth. And we live in an era where global missions seems to have dropped off the agenda of the British church. In fact, I meet a lot of people who think we shouldn't go anywhere anymore. Why? Well, because we've got too much to do here. We need to get our act in order first, and then we can go. Hey, listen, that sounds like the idea that we've got to sort out our Jerusalem, and only then do we go. That's not what Jesus said. Sometimes we think, oh, you know what? Mission's really problematic in a post-colonial world. Isn't it not like colonialism by another name? Isn't it arrogant? Isn't it insensitive? It can be if it's badly done. 
But the authority is Jesus' authority. He is the one who says, all authority has been given to me, so go. And I come not as an arrogant, oh, I know how to do life. Oh, I know all the answers. I'm going to just talk down to you and tell. No, I go to serve. The motivation for mission is one of love and service. In the same way that Jesus was sent, the humble servant, so too we are sent. Not as arrogant, superior colonialists, but as those under authority with love as our primary motivation. That's the first application. Second, mission has not got any geographical center. The fancy word is it's polycentric. We in the UK are one tiny part of a global church. We realize that now with brothers and sisters coming to us from all over the world, many from countries with much stronger and larger churches than us. We are one, end, we're an end of the earth. We're a cold, wet, damp end of the earth. That's who we are. We used to think we were the center of the world. All those maps that we've got on our wall, we've always got Britain in the middle. Have you noticed? Hmm, I wonder why that is. Who, who, who drew the maps? Yes, we know. The British did. We are an end of the earth, far from the center. The center of global Christianity is in the global south, in sub-Saharan Africa. The church has moved south and east. So are we done now? Oh, phew. We don't have to do it anymore. It's over to them. No, no, no. Mission is polycentric. There's no one geographical center. Every part, every church, every geographical church has got a role to play. Mission is not west to the rest, but from everyone to everyone. And we rejoice to have brothers and sisters from other lands right here in Hull working alongside us in this global mission, don't we? But let's not think, oh, great, they've come to us now, we're done. No, no. Our brothers and sisters in other lands likewise rejoice when God calls and sends you to serve alongside them. We are a global church with a global responsibility. What a joy. And lastly, mission. It's urgent. The age that we live in, the age of grace, the gospel age, one day will come to an end because the Lord Jesus will return. Oh, good place for hallelujah. I'll say it again. <laughs> this gospel age will end because one day the Lord Jesus is going to return. Hallelujah. There we go. When the Lord returns, we don't know when he's coming back, but we do know it's sooner today than it was yesterday. Okay? We don't know when, but it's sooner today than it was yesterday. And when he comes back, it's too late for all those outside of Christ. That's why it's urgent. Because one third of the world, more than one third of the world, 3.2 billion people is the best estimate, have yet to hear the good news about Jesus. How long will they wait? I said yesterday, 87% of all Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists in the world will die having never heard today, unless something changes. What needs to change? <laughs> Obedience of the global church to the great commission statements of Jesus. In too much of the world today, access to the gospel is non-existent. That's what makes it different from the really important and urgent task that we have in Hull of sharing with people in Hull. It's urgent. But every person in Hull, at any time they want, can come into a church, this church, and hear and meet and access the Bible. And that's just not the case for one third of the planet. That's why this is urgent. And that's what drives my life. That's what makes me love to be invited to come and do mission weekends at churches like the Christ Church Network. My question for you as I finally finish is this. What are you going to do about this? What are you going to do in response to what the Lord has shown us from his word. There's an urgent need for people to realize that we've all been sent. 
There's an urgent need for you to realize we have everything we need in the Holy Spirit of God for the task he's given us. And we've been given our call. (laughs) We've been sent to go into the whole world. So I'd love for you, I'd urge you, in fact, to commit with me to join our global church in fulfilling the Great Commission. Yesterday, I was talking about why these places are unreached. These are, some of these places are really hard places to go. And I quoted, it was actually a Nigerian brother who, had, who once said, there are no places that are unreachable. There are just places people don't want to go. There are just places people don't want to go. Let's pray to the Lord that we would be obedient to his leading. Let's pray. Gracious God, our loving heavenly Father, as we sit here before you this evening, having received your word, our prayer is simply this. Move us, O God, by your spirit to be obedient to your command and take our part in your mission in these days, in your world, that the name of Jesus might extend to the ends of the earth, that he would be glorified in all nations. We pray in his wonderful and precious name. Amen.